Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Unicus Radio Hour. I'm your Jedi host, Robert Stanley, broadcasting live from Palm Springs, California, on the greatest alternative talk radio station on the planet, KGRA. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, always a privilege and a pleasure today. We have a special guest who's also streaming through his uh, platform. Uh, so let me introduce Alan Stakian. He's a, he's the host of Simulation, and uh, he's an, an interlocutor. I'm not sure what that means. Polymath, host of as I said, host of Simulation, which is, a, and you never heard of it, is a daily show and a live event seri- series featuring global leaders solving humanity's most pressing challenges. That sounds very um, difficult. Um, let, let me tell you a little bit more about Alan, because I'm still learning. I'm still learning, okay? We just met recently, and uh, he's hosted a science comedy game show called Eureka. We, we I need to know more about this, because I'm actually hoping to host my own game show someday. I did, okay. Um, and that was in San Francisco. And he's also produced a two-day festival called World's Fair Nano in New York City and San Francisco. Um, so let's see. He's In 2015, he, he ch- decided to quit his 9-to-5 job and ask random people on the streets of San Francisco thought-provoking questions for a project called Practice Happy. That sounds really cool. So ultimately, this is I think this is what led into this current project called simulation alan sakian welcome to the program robert stanley thank you so much for having me i'm so excited for this and huge shout out to bill skywatch yeah. for helping us make this happen too yeah bill's the best i'm so lucky to have him as my producer so okay tell us a little bit more about what simulation is well yeah okay i was gonna ask you what is the ultimate nature of our reality first but let's start with me and then we'll get to all that good yeah, stuff yeah. because i'm so excited to okay. talk to you about that subject there's some pl- planet okay. earth is a very interesting specimen experiment happening um yeah yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i mean you got that really right um yeah, I, f- I found myself being born in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I uh, noticed that the people around me, for some reason, um, didn't have necessarily this global drive to make some sort of profound change. And so I moved to Silicon Valley, and that's been seven years ago I moved here, and I've just been mm-hmm. just connecting with different leaders at the edge of their fields, everything from... Uh, biotechnology, neurotechnology, AI and robotics, spirituality, art, science, uh, decentralization, uh, geopolitics, geoeconomics, every single field I'm trying to dive deep into and talk to the leaders in and then try and synthesize what they know into some sort of a relatable and educational piece for other adults and kids on the planet so they can gain a better understanding of the ultimate nature of our reality. And right now mm-hmm. I'm mostly doing it through the show called Simulation where I take these different leaders and I bring them on for one hour long interviews on our show and we talk about their journeys, why why they're doing what they're doing, why it's important, why it's building a better future. And we poke at them for the ethical quandaries that exist around these fields. And we poke at them about what's going on uh, beyond the 3D reality in the multidimensional, hyperdimensional spaces, what's what's at play on planet Earth beyond us. And um, we talk about that. We, we poke a lot at people and augment their perspectives, these different leaders. And so, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. And yeah, before that was a science comedy show i was asking random people on the streets questions I was producing that world's fair so yeah just so really wow. yeah that, that's 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 um that's a pretty good bit on on me well there was one other piece and i couldn't i came across it and i bookmarked it and i can't find it now you apparently worked in washington dc for a period of time can you tell us about that oh dc is interesting um i spent a good chunk of my uh high school days as actually the the president of the teenage republicans club at my high school and then wow. yeah and then i went to the you know teenage republicans camp i helped several of the candidates in the uh south dakota um uh house and senate with um with running for their uh positions as well as just local sioux falls uh candidates as well and um Mm -hmm. yeah and i uh i went to visit dc um and i visited actually also tucker carlson's recording studio and stuff like that and yeah and it was it was interesting um and i spoke with a couple people that were a little bit um deeper in the state and it was it was quite interesting seeing what was happening there but i've kind of had that political edge and just to just to be clear and you know explain 
I moved to San Francisco. So I went hyper left. <laughs> and then I immediately, once I noticed both sides of the spectrum and I gained the empathy from knowing both sides of the spectrum, I find myself yeah. in the center as a centrist, hyper driven yeah. by nuance, by multivariability, by the art of really good conversation, steel manning each other's points. Um, and just trying to synthesize from both fields into what could be uh, the best. And so, yeah, so just to give that little bit of a uh, background, too, so people don't think that I'm uh, clear on one side <laughs> of any. Yeah. You're not politically polarized? Not whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Good yeah. for you. Hey, but since you brought it up, because I was kind of curious, how, in your opinion, can we bring both extreme sides of the party, so-called left and right wing, What what would be your best case scenario obviously a peaceful solution or resolution to the to the current conflict that's going on it's hmm. a fantastic question robert yeah but we need a fantastic answer that's the problem this is, this is what happens what when is. you get two interlocutors two dialectics <laughs> uh interviewers going back and forth because we like asking yeah, 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 questions yeah. and so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, look at this. Uh, you don't have to answer right this minute. Let's just put it this way. If you or anybody else in this audience has an idea, even any idea is better than nothing because the way we're going right now, especially with the media, seems to be constantly promoting or hyping up the, the, the differences or um, what do you call it? The, the disputes as opposed to the, I mean, here's it. They're focused on the problem. I never hear them talking about the solution. Never. Or maybe I'm missing something. I don't. I guess maybe I'm not paying close enough attention. But it's weird because people on the extreme left are going, "We know the answer. We got to just go and impeach Trump." And people on the right are saying, "No, just shut up and let us build a wall or whatever it is." I'm, I'm oversimplifying now, but it's not. They they are so not meeting in the middle here. It's kind of weird. S something that I think really uh, helps people come together is understanding the origin of the species. Because okay. then they get, and it's not just the species, but even our world and all of the species on the planet, the origin story of the universe and the origin story of life okay. in general. Because when, when someone gets the origin story of life, then they get that we come from the same source. And when uh -huh. they get that we True. come from the same source, the same mother, the same spirit that we all, all life or has arisen from then there's this deeper you when you look at someone's eyes robert and everyone that's listening and watching when you look at someone's eyes really deeply for a long period of time 60 seconds or more and just in peace looking at their eyes you yeah get the window directly into who they are their essence their spirit their life and then you really get how we come from that same source that this person has it's the word sonder they have their own uh life experiences their own input stream that's led them into having their family their friends their coworkers, people online that they talk to their goals their north star their ambition in life what they're pursuing and when we can humble ourselves a little bit to see that divine mm -hmm. nature in each other and our callings on this planet, then we can realize that we can more effectively collaborate and compete and collaborate and compete and work together um, and also reharmonize back with that nature, with that spirit that so many of the indigenous cultures around the planet are saying that we got disconnected from. And that's why we have all of yeah. the issues that we have in our civilization. So that's probably this main key for bringing people together, I think, is when you reharmonize with the divine nature of life, that there is something in the first place instead of nothing and that we're mm -hmm. here experiencing this as avatars and it's so beautiful as characters and <laughs> that we can share this together in a more abundant and prosperous way um yeah instead of a scarce way right yeah it's it's i think to simplify it it's um the difference is coming from a place of love as opposed to a place of fear seems and you know, fear and anger and all the the dis it's to be more specific i'd say dissonance versus resonance yeah. one is sustainable the other one is not and unfortunately it seems like especially in political arenas it's like the dissonance is increasing which is not good for you know if these people are supposedly representing our country it's that's that's a dead end ultimately so 
it's it's a huge problem, and I and I don't, I don't know that there's a simple answer. Although that would be nice if we could just get a simple answer, and but then implementing it, you know, these people seem like they're really very um, uh, isolated, and they, you know, again, even though they say they are duly elected representatives, they act like they are um, lords, or over, uh, you know, all of us, and and. Um, uh, geez, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it, it bothers me actually. <laughs> in the, another really good question, Robert, is to ask people is how would you redesign civilization? And when, okay. when we ask that question to each other, we think, well, what way could we rebuild our society to maximize prosperity? That every single child that's born into the world should have these basic nutrients. If you imagine them as a seed, and they have the root systems in the yeah. soil. They need love and compassion. They need air. They need water. They need food. They need to identify right. what their North Star is. And they need to pursue that. And so if any of those nutrients mm -hmm. are missing, they're not going to have as many fruits in their tree. And so we right. want every child to have the potential to have an abundant tree full of fruits that they can share with themselves, their families, their community, society at large. And so this is one of the big aspects to the synthesis that I'm working on is this idea of the seed, the seed theory. How can we do that more effectively? Yeah. Okay, so um, I don't know if you heard me talking or if I actually sent you the link, but the top of my page, unicusmagazine.com, the website, there's three three free books called AMI, mm -hmm. A M I, the friendly extraterrestrial, and it actually has the blueprint in there for what a civilized world, how it operates, and more importantly, how it's connected to other civilized worlds through a fellowship, in peace and prosperity for everybody. Um, there are no borders. There's no government the way we think of, or governments for one planet. Everybody lives as family. It's it's absolutely mind-boggling and beautiful. And and for some reason, there's a few people in this audience that have written to me say, Robert, I can't find, I don't know what's wrong. I, I'm looking all over your website. It's at the top. I I, I think it's so, so important. I put it at the top of the page at unicusmagazine.com. Uh, you can't miss it. I mean, if you do, I, I don't understand why. It's only been a couple people, actually. But I'm a little concerned because it's so obvious when you go there um, uh, to the top of my home page. All right? Because I'm using that. I'm not just putting it in the library or whatever. I'm putting, I'm using my homepage as a bulletin board since there's a lot of space there. Yep. Instead of just having the nav bar, the nav bar at the top, I'm actually letting people see my thought process. I'm doing this on an up, I'm updating on a daily basis now because there's just so much information coming in. And it seems to be all very, very positive and loving and um, uh, foundational in what the conversation we're having now, the work you're doing, I'm doing from different angles about building a better future for everyone and all living things. That's really what I'm excited I about. It, Robert. Right. Totally. Yeah, me too. Totally. <laughs> yes. Yes. And well, mm -hmm. Hey, we're, you know, we're all blessed. All right. And I know it doesn't always seem like it some days, but even the toughest moments in life are actually very, um, uh, they're they're in helping us through grow life lessons and, and i yeah through life lessons and overcoming these challenges especially when we reach out to others there was my favorite line in the movie starman as he was getting ready to leave and he was talking to that little government employee and he said let me tell you something the thing i love about you guys is that you're at your best when things are at their worst so i i really don't want to see bad things happen but who knows maybe <laughs> This, you know, all the insanity that's going on is going to lead to some sort of breakthrough. Actually, what I've always said in my counseling was that um, in order to have a breakthrough, typically the way we're set up, we have to have a breakdown. Mm. Literally, it feels like I'm having a breakdown. Well, okay, because the walls are coming down and now you're starting to really feel, see and feel more. And yeah, it hurts a little bit, but you know, growth is like that. Growth is painful. So On the other I do side think, of our I really greatest like traumas it. are our greatest treasures, and same thing with our challenges. Oh, okay, that's an, you know, that. These, like are, that. these are little tests of faith, if you'll let me indulge for a little bit on, on the oh. trajectory. So if Robert Stanley has yeah. this life trajectory, and so he's, he's going towards his North Star, and he's identifying mm -hmm. the direction over time with his life, there are going to be these bifurcating moments on the trajectory. 
And so the idea is that at these moments, it, to be extremely vigilant and understanding, is this a bifurcating moment that's trying to suck my spirit in and take me off of my North Star trajectory? Or is this something that maybe um, maybe it's like one of the negative ones could be something like an addiction like an addiction to an exogenous substance that I have to use, that I use all the time now versus something. Yeah. <laughs> versus, versus a, a positive trajectory happens, moment yeah. is something like if you take the advice of a mentor um, that's trusted, that's that um, gives you maybe one of those little, uh, uh, like a, a short, like a hack or a shortcut, something that like helps you um, achieve your North Star faster. And so these things are, yeah. it's a character. Robert, what can you do to level up your character towards your North Star as fast as possible? And how can your North Star alignment be as Nash equilibrium as possible so that you're both able to sustain yourself well and not materialize yourself, but sustain yourself and your well-being well. Meanwhile, also providing with that equilibrium to society, you're providing value with more society than you're capturing from society. Mm, yeah, so some level of reciprocity there. Yeah, I understand. And I, look, everybody has that choice to make. You And you can't force people to do it. That's the other thing. That's why government, I think, and religion is so ineffective in that regard when it comes to society. They really, both of those agencies kind of fall short. Hey, look, they, I'm not saying they're completely flawed. They could just do a lot better. And ultimately, again, those those books that supposedly children's books, um, uh, what a what an incredible message of love. And and also, um, as you were saying, a blueprint, a divine blueprint yes. for for what is the what is the best possible uh, uh, society? What would it look like? And it's outlined in those books. Um, again, it's really just a summary because you can't you can't explain everything to everybody about all that stuff. I think in fact it, I don't think that's even fair because you know those are things that we will experience. Those of us that want to experience going off world and living uh, you know civilized as civilized uh, children of the cosmos or whatever you call it, you know part of the fellowship or federation. But it's not you know, the thing the thing one of the things that we are really kind of I think is blocking us is this whole concept of uh, military type of domination uh, it, it's, it's, they call it nation building, but actually, typically, it's about destroying a nation or a country and then rebuilding it in your own image, alleged democracy, we even though this is a republic. Not to get all political on people, but I mean, just saying that the, this thing is that we're doing right now is unsustainable. And I don't think going to another world or worlds is going to make it any better. In fact, I think it's just going to complicate matters. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, 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 that's such a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the uh, indigenous wisdom is kind of like shouting at all of the people living in metropolis, right? Metropolises right now, like the kids being born can't see any stars due to light pollution. They walk into grocery stores. They've yeah. never been to a farm. They've never put their hands in the soil. They think that a piece of paper is exchanges for an apple, and they don't know how the apple is grown. Um, yeah. all these, all these types of, 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 of like the trade that we're making for productivity to build something like an infrastructure of 5g technologies, which again, who are we building these things for and how do they longitudinally yeah. affect our health, our physiology, our biology? How do we know these things that we're not slowing down to think, but we're just rushing forward as quickly as possible so that the economies, the economy is, has now become a machine that has no pause button. There's no stop the economy day. There's everything is just <laughs> constantly roaring and there's no, it has, it's yeah. so massive. There's not even a little rudder. There's no rudder at the back. So you can't even really make yeah. it on a more positive trajectory, but that's kind of the role of the entrepreneur or the artist or the spiritual leader is to try and move the rudder towards a more positive trajectory. I, and the aspect of, of, of preserving consciousness and moving it off the, off the rock to other rocks. Um, I, everyone, I, a lot of people that I know are really uh, pushing that that's an important part of our future. And it is an important part of yeah. our future. 
at, at the same time to un- actually spiritually graduate from third grade first on planet Earth is equivalently important and probably yeah. even prioritize that first, graduate first, and then, yeah. Here, before we try to export anything. Yeah, yeah. The problems to other rocks, yeah. Yeah, and I believe that the the books I was telling you about, the AMI, A-M-I, the friend, E.T. friend, that explains something to me that I've been struggling with. And I know a lot of people in this field of so-called uh, new age or uh, alternative stuff, uh, specifically about extraterrestrials, there's this narrative that we have embraced about them being evil or a threat. And, I mean, that even came up recently. New York Times said, oh, the Pentagon's investigating the threat, you know, as if the Pentagon's not a threat, you know. Uh, uh, so the the problem is that um, unless we actually, like you said, become peaceful here now, I don't think we're getting off the planet. There seems to be a mechanism that's built into the cosmos that prevents a virus like this, the insanity, this negativity, from getting off world and then infecting other worlds. So it's I know a lot of people are not going to be happy with that because they're we have all been programmed to believe that, you know, every all the other extra you know, people on other planets must be exactly like us. And I'm sure some of them are uncivilized and, and militant like us. But I, they're either going to blow themselves up or they're never getting off that rock either. Fermi paradox, you know? yeah. So, Where are they? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. Yeah. And and so that's something that's been largely overlooked for whatever reason. I, I kind of know what it is, but I, I don't want to belabor the point. The the the, pro, the thing I want to focus though on more is this. We already know what the problem is. Unfortunately, when we externalize the, our own problems by saying, you know, the devil made me do it or it's the reptilians or whatever, you know, that is not going to resolve our, in, our, our imbalance typically is, is, is pretty simple. Don't, I mean, really, how much love do you have? How much resonance are you willing to, to generate or embrace in your life? Love those two words that you came back to, love and resonance. The more that we can bring that forth from within ourselves and then around our families and our communities and our society, the more that we can bring that, that feeling, that energy forth, then we, don't, <clears throat> then we don't need to sit and go, I'm being controlled right now. And the, the, yeah. the defeatist attitude. Can I, I do want to ask you, though, Robert, okay. I, I want to ask you this question. What is the ultimate nature of our reality here on planet earth well i'm still thinking about that one alan um because my no here's the here's the reason i'm I'm, i'll answer the question as best of my ability but i just want to say as a caveat that i'm i'm still trying to figure that out myself and it should be self-evident honestly everybody should know the foundation or or the origins as you're as you're talking about here of our true nature not just our true nature but the nature of the cosmos and um, it seems like that, like everything else here, we have all these competing theories or narratives or whatever about what it is, how it came into be, and what our role yeah. is in it ultimately. So I don't think there's a simple answer to that. Alan, you had asked me, yeah, yes. what is the nature of this reality? Yes, yeah. yes. Apparently, because, we, uh, okay, so my understanding at this point, just, just to be clear, is that um, uh, because it's multidimensional, that this particular realm that we're in typically is an illusion. I, I think you know the Hindus had it right when they called it Maya mm. uh, or an illusion, because uh, as as uh, what do you call uh, well not quantum physics, it it just shows that everything that we think of is solid isn't, and that so therefore right there is one level of the illusion. The other thing is that we also in, I think we are living an illusion in the sense that. That there's everything, so-called inanimate objects are not only solid, but they have zero consciousness, which is not true, because consciousness is waves. And when you look at the, a, a particle, even a so-called solid matter, it really is waves as well. So there's different levels of consciousness for sure. You know, as it was described to me, is consciousness is one level of waveform, then you have Energy is a slightly lower waveform, and then you have matter. 
but they're all waveforms and they're all interrelated. I think the bigger question is what is generating mm. all these waveforms throughout creation? Mm. And, and, and at that point, I would have to, you know, to kind of default back to the soul or souls mm. that were created. Like you said, these seeds, I call them mm. seeds of light or some people call them God seeds or whatever. But they look, we look like seeds of light in a garden of light that's interconnected through a web of mm. light that was all divinely and intelligently created to support mm-hmm. life, which means consciousness. So it's like the, this is one of the, the key components that um, science currently does not want to address. I don't think they're, most, of, most of them aren't doing that. The fact that everything is conscien- conscious or of consciousness, that it is spirit that ultimately moves down into the lower frequencies of matter and, and, and then ultimately returns back. To the, to the higher frequency is constantly cycling through but we know through the entanglement right quantum entanglement everything is connected but like the way it was shown to me one of my contacts out there in Malibu in the mountains was that everything is really connected through this web of light including us the weird part is we can choose to disconnect somehow somehow that's an option because of free will and when when we do that Typically, we suffer. We don't have the same level of awareness or abilities that would that normally come with having a, that level of connectivity to the all of creation. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, you took us on an incredible trajectory there. So, <clears throat> I'll also <laughs> I'll also hit it from another um, perspective that's super aligned with that. Right. Is that we were talking about source earlier in the conversation? What what is creation in the first place? What started mm-hmm. this Big Bang and this universe as well as potentially all of these other parallel running universes that are potentially housing different forms of consciousness, these different forms of life to why, why, why? And it seems yeah. as though this is a massive artistic expression of God, of creation, of source, mm-hmm. that especially planet Earth is hilariously beautiful because it is the one of the only places that you can be birthed and so that you are under the illusion that you are separate from creation oh uh-huh. and so when and so that's the idea is that when you're born that the first thing you got to do is and this is one of the massive most massive problems on the planet is that Children aren't informed that they're part of source. And so that's the first key right. is remember that you are source, you are creation, that we are all nerve endings of creation, feeling, artistically expressing ourselves. And then the second thing that the kids need is to know their North Star and so that they have to figure out what is their unique expression of their own artistic capacity on this rock. And so hmm. um, and then the, now you get a little bit deeper in the space. I'm still starting to you know learn about it. Mostly through people like Bernard Gunther and Tom Montauk are the people that I'm most um, following in the space. I'm trying to follow more people in it. But what about what about beyond, you know, okay, creation happened and then the idea is that, okay, why is it that there it seems to be that this is a a big chessboard for light and dark forces? And why does it seem like and who's in control of what 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 are these controls beyond the the actual physical planet and then what is actually going on on the surface through humans and we're like channels and then there's different power structures that are happening and it's it's supposed to be that's why this book ami that you're talking about is again one of these ideas of like this uh, what could be what could be this pinnacle civilization? And I love that idea. And there's always room for like mm. mimetic parallax to continue building a better and better world. This is not a finality. Right. But then the other notion is that well, is is the artistic expression beautiful the way it is with the exact amount of light and dark, good and bad that's on here playing? Because then we actually have the this this beauty of there's a struggle still that we have to figure ourselves out this type of thing mm. well if this is really a nursery for seeds of light 
you know, when you plant a seed, it has to go into the soil, which is dark, and it has to struggle towards the light. And so, it's, and as it as it does that, it becomes strong, stronger and stronger, and it has to now it has to endure other challenges like whatever. So, so or, you know, yeah, but I mean, it's organic. See, this is the thing about it. We tend to, especially in this culture, we tend to look at things very synthetically, and including ourselves. And I, I feel that's a huge disservice that we're doing to our divine nature. Um, that it, you know. <laughs> Somehow we look down on it like nature is something that we need to dominate or exploit when in fact we're part of that. And the, the more closely that we harmonize with it and respect it, the better it is because that is a level of reciprocity. And again, if it's all based on consciousness, there's going to be this feedback mechanism that, that comes to us in a very positive way. If we put it out positively, then it's going to come back. I mean, that's, that's, just, not, that's just so obvious. But again, you say, if you started a child in, in a culture like that, then surely their path forward would be, it's just like having seeds in a garden. If you, yes. if you let all the weeds go and there's rocks in the soil and there's no nutrients and it's just like, whoa, they're going to be like dwarf and mutant and maybe they'll get somewhere. But no, but if you clear the soil you, and you give it nutrients and all the water and, and even love, you know, I was asking a friend recently because I say, when in Hong Kong, you know, it's like, why are the Japanese fruits so expensive and so delicious? And uh, oh, it's actually my 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 friend's son. He was he's been living there. It was part of an exchange program. He's actually living there and working in Japan. And he said they they love their um, the plants. Yeah. They, he says they, they, for one fruit, they may even just and they they'll sing to the tree and yeah, they'll yeah. you know they bring it the nutrients and they're just so happy that this tree is alive and it's gonna it's going to give them this gift of the its fruit and the, it it's like they, they, you think you, you know just an apple you think oh it's just an apple whoa you cut it open it's like my god I've never smelled an apple like that or tasted anything like it and it's it's just that's you know that's how we can be that's how we are we're just like that fruit. Mmm, mmm, I love it, Robert. That's that's <laughs> that's so good. Yeah, the the um, what we can do for remembering what nourishes us, each breath of air, each sip of water, each bite of food is literally us being nourished by source. And when we remember right. that. And we fully embody that. We're more connected on a moment-to-moment, -moment, breath by breath, even basis. And your example is so beautiful. There's all these other examples that have been happening around the world where people are singing to patients as well, and they're and their spirit. They're calling. They're calling the clearance of certain diseases. They're calling the all types of. Um, um, healthcare augmentations, all these types of things, the growing the food on the tree in the garden. And like your example too, we're so, we got to remember, mm -hmm. here's a really good way to put it too, Robert. If we're only just such a minute percentage, even point percentage difference from our evolved ancestors, right? Doesn't yeah. it doesn't it sometimes feel like we're crickets trying to imagine the big game? <laughs> we're trying to imagine the big game, right? The big game of creation yeah. as crickets. And so and so we got to yeah. do our best to envision what that big game is. And I actually think, you know, part of the reason why the show is called Simulation and for all those tuning in, you can find it simulationseries.com is where you can find it or on YouTube Simulation Series. The idea behind it, one of the reasons is that once a civilization of consciousness becomes uh, has enough computational capacity, and you can you you hear about it all the time now with this word digital twin, you can make a digital twin of Robert yeah. Stanley and see all of his biometrics yeah. happening and add a specific uh, action to his body and see how it affects him before you do it to the actual physical one. You can make a digital twin of the civilization. So that general idea is that if you can run a simulation of a civilization and you literally press the start button this is like the creation right this is like we're talking yeah. about this artistic expression unleash it you
you can just like when you edit video for those are time lapses for those that know what that's like you can take a 13.8 billion year period and i can literally just click and drag through the 13.8 billion year period as i please right and then i can watch play what happens and then fast forward 500 years watch the evolution of fire and language and an art and religion and and books and and all different types of civilizational tools processes and then you gain so much insight from thinking about things in that way you get this we're talking about being the crickets and thinking about the big game well then you get the perspective of the big game when you do stuff like that when you run these thought experiments and talk to your friends and other people about these thought experiments huh yeah it sounds very similar to what they say the akashic record that there's some sort of uh, yep. way that you can scroll through that uh, and it, I, it's not just a simulation what do they call it um uh, no, and it's not artificial life. Sugarscape was the first one that they did like this. So there's it, it, here's the thing: there's you have digital ants in a in a program, and you have very simple rules. The red ants and the black ants are competing for digital sugar, and and the funny thing is, as simple as that is, every time they ran the program, it was a slightly different permutation would come up, and I believe that's that's kind of how we are. Yeah. It, it just, it just, it, there's so many potentialities that we can't really say for sure what it is, but we have a, a kind of a general idea of, of how things will happen, but they don't, you know, they, it's, there's no guarantees. And I'm pretty sure that this is, again, this is part of the rule in the background of this particular, if you want to call it a simulation, uh, is, is that there is a, um, the negative, there is there's a negative like a parasitic like an av av that that if we do not have enough or I should say when we do not have enough love that means that they, we uh, we have some level of negativity in our hearts that's when the the these parasites actually have uh, it's like it gives them something to latch onto it's a signal that they they can then uh, uh, hack into. And ultimately control us for their benefit. And there's the, but the ultimate benefit of all that is, if if our negativity gets so much higher than our love, the fear overcomes the love, then the system collapses. You know, it just and it does. But the thing is, it'll reset. That's the other cool thing about it is that there's const there's this constant reset. That's why I'm not sure that the Big Bang is is accurate. It's possible that there was just a, a reset. Um, because we, you know, time as we know it is is relative. It probably doesn't r exist or or have any relevance whatsoever to the bigger picture. So it's it's an assumption. That's why I call it the Big Bang theory. It's not been proven. It it makes sense to us, but that doesn't mean that it's re it's real or accurate. So we've got a lot to learn. I'm sh and thank goodness we. <laughs> There's a lot to learn because if we had it all figured out, that would be, well, that would be the end of the game or the show. It would be over, I suppose. Every time, if we don't have love that we're deeply connected to within our essence and we're sharing that around the world and our communities, our families, etc., we're giving space for fear, for other parasite to come through us. And then that immediately cascades as a butterfly effect around us as well ah yeah right. yeah yeah i remember that the chaos complexity the butterfly sneezes in the bu <laughs> in the bush you know the whole it's like well that's again about entanglement everything is connected to everything else and so that's why when you, it sounds oh just be loving well guess what when you do that it's because we're connected to everything else it does resonate out the more resonance or love that you have, it goes out into the creation. So it's not a small thing when you are being, when you are f feeling and sharing love. It it actually is. It's it is the antidote. It is the answer. It's yeah, massive. It is. And Robert, another really great way of putting it is that if it just yeah. watch one example for everyone, just watch what happens when you go for a full day of smiling like <laughs> wide smile wide with enthusiasm everywhere you go and lock deeply with other people in eye contact during that smile you'll see mm. such a big shift in other people's days by seeing your ecstatic smiling 
And so, yeah, it's you know, contagious. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And then they go on to their families with a bigger smile and their communities. And so this is, this is, and, and this is not coming from someone that's perfect, that always does it themselves. This is someone that's right, right, are, right. We're always learning, and we're 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 cre- we're creatures that are that are constantly iterating on our on our on our on how to align ourselves most divinely with our with our north stars. But that is such a big one, Robert. Love and spreading that around you on a moment to moment basis. Um, but, but, but yeah. really, no, not not just intellectualizing it, Robert. We have such a big problem with people that intellectualize things in our world. I, yeah, I, I'm, um, you know, just talking to um, Mama Nui Juan, the the Kogi elder from Colombia, um, one of these indigenous tr- um, wisdoms that are that are coming through these tribes that are coming through and saying these things. I mean, they're so clear about it. It's just in the head everything's in the head i get it i understand uh i i i and then and then versus when like literally just zip silence your mouth close your eyes tap in and reconnect to yourself reconnect to your heart tap into your body and tap into this channel of divinity what is your north star reflect on that process more talk to your friends about Mm. their north stars find other young people and older people that have connected their north stars and learn from them and that process and you can see it nature is the best teacher you can see the divinity in nature on a moment to moment basis it's oozing love (laughs) (laughs) sure like i said it's a web of light when you want to connect to it when we choose to connect to it it does it it gives us all kinds of nutrients or information or i I look at it this way just to be simple trying to simplify it if you want to be healthier and happier and smarter and stronger increase the love quotient in your heart i love it by whatever means works for you okay I mean, I'm just saying, I know it works. I'm doing it myself and I'm sharing. That's one of the reasons I'm so adamant about sharing those Ami books with people. But I was looking at Celestine Prophecy last night. Sort of like I, w- I, I do this with books sometimes like a magic eight ball. You know, you kind of shake it up and then you, you look and see what is your what is the answer. Well, I just, I this is how it is. I just open, I just crack open a book and see if there's, if there's a message yep. in there. Well, because I've been focusing on this whole thing about love and creation or God. And so Father Sanchez says mm. to the whatever the character's name in Celestine Prophecy. I know it's it's Red, James Redfield wrote this, but he said uh, the Father Sanchez he defined what love is and is not, and this I thought was very very instructive. Uh, he it, it's, it's love is not an intellectual concept, which we were talking about before about yeah. thinking too much. It's it's not an intellectual concept or a moral imperative or anything else it is a background emotion that exists when one is connected to the energy available in the universe which of course is the energy of god which is love and oh I, my god man, that's so that, good I, was, I know i got the chills and i was looking at it, i go oh, oh oh okay thank you it's like thank you magic eight ball you know it's like <laughs> oh god. it's crazy because again if i if i open myself to the idea or the reality that we we're just describing here that it, everything is consciousness then i'm going to i'm going to get these downloads i'm open because i'm open closed and that's I, actually that's how i get been able to get so much information in a relatively short time in this in this life just by opening myself up and more importantly sharing it with others and instead of just hanging on to it going uh oh, you know who cares about everybody else part of the agreement part of my relationship with creation is that hey you you want to give it to me i'll just pass it on to other people because i know that that are interested it's going to help them too and in that regard, it'll kind of everybody's going to, you know, raise their, what do they say? Rising tide lifts rising all the boats. Rising tide lifts all the boats. <laughs> That's very beautifully said that love is not the intellectual. Love is this background no. emotion that exists. And the love is, and here's another um, word potentially for um, the listeners and viewers right now, is pantheism. Pantheism. Mm. Everything is part of an all-encompassing, imminent God. Universe and God are identical. All forms of reality may then be considered either modes of that being. And so, you know, this is, again, this is God is not behind nature. God is nature. Pan- pantheism. <laughs> all yeah, right. all is God. All is God. So yeah. all is love. And 
and there's other um there's other like we were talking a little bit about panpsychism everything is conscious um uh, animism is another one everything has animism a soul or yeah. spirit yep that one is another one um another good one i i think this is another good one um actually for for people from what we were mentioning at the beginning part um where you're super polarized versus more synthesizing is mm. um is two thoughts um uh, eclecticism which is very much so like a polymath you draw upon multiple theory styles or ideas to gain complementary insights into a subject um it, oh. yeah it comes from greek that's what a polymath uh, so is poly, yeah polymath like <laughs> having learned much and that it comes from uh, greek oh, okay. eclecticos literally choosing the best and sy- syncretism uh, comes from syncresis combining of different beliefs blending schools of thought merging assimilating ah. several discrete fields or tra- traditions like theology okay. and mythology of religion asserting underlying unity um allowing inclusive approaches to other faiths this type of thing so ah. syc- syncretic politics would work here for what we were talking about so um yeah 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 uh, oh the other thing we were talking about too is uh i forgot the other component about when we go into this mode of the threat the it's always the external enemy is that in especially in this world uh i can't deal with the external enemy so i'm looking for an external savior and and that is a recipe for disaster (laughs) every freaking time that doesn't work it absolutely doesn't work. It's just, uh, and it it, it, it abdic- basically abdicates any re- personal responsibility for one's well-being, and uh, especially the love quotient that they're feeling. It's just like you just completely given up. If you're the captain of the ship, you're just like, hey, I uh, I don't want to steer anymore, you guys. <laughs> and it's crazy. It really is crazy. You you're rocking it there. I love how you keep using the words love quotient. I love that one. And then um to reflect yeah. on that when we wake up in the morning and go to bed at night instead of immediately grabbing our phones, but please just reflect on our okay. love quotient. That one. <laughs> and then and then you um you're also mentioning like we gotta remember that everything that we need is endogenously found with in us it's found within us our north star our actualization yeah. in this world and our gifts that we can bring other people is found within us and so anytime we're looking for exogenous things to actualize it's already a recipe for disaster mm. yeah it's the role politicians and priests play anyway boom is that they're supposedly um some they're, they're in a position to, <laughs> yeah. to save the day uh, yeah, yeah. in fact they're probably <laughs> screwing it it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's so much right. self-dealing that happens the good part though it's crazy it's all it's mostly self-dealing the, the good part mostly is self-dealing the, well, has I, evolved in those categories it's so much less about actually um inclusive global fitness and it's way more about um just how can i deal yeah. myself quickly and then get out of the equation um if there's self-dealing propaganda in food companies, there's fake food, there's fake news, yep. there's fake physicians <laughs> happening, there's fake teaching happening. Um, and so it's so important to be very vigilant with the input stream that we consume, be very vigilant with what we put in our bodies. What, yeah, we got two minutes at the top of the I want to ask you one. Uh, this is an easier question. What is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, oh, that's... Um, well, it's love, obviously, but I think that's a very um, objective, no, excuse me, subjective question because to me, all right, let's put it this way. The most beautiful sound is a baby laughing. Ooh. I think the most ugly sound is a baby crying. And it's, it's they're just so, but it's coming from the same source and it's just like yeah. one, is dis, one is dissonance, one is distress, the other one is joy and love and resonance. So, it's anyway it's it's all it's the the cool thing is that we have an incredible potential here to tap into in the future and that's what i'm looking forward to 